Imagine what it'd be like if we were really curious about each other. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the weekly podcast of LargerStory.com, the podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as relational. Now, here's your host for this week, Kep Crab. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us again. We are now going to be chatting about the second question. As we talked about the seven questions of spiritual theology, let me just real quickly run through the, the, the seven questions so you familiarize yourself with them. Who is God? Question number one. Question number two, what's God up to? And that's going to be the question that we chat about today. Question three, who are we? Question four, what's gone wrong? Question five, what's God done? about our problem, about what's gone wrong. Question six, how is God's spirit moving today? And question seven, how do we join in the spirit's movement? So I'm joined today by my good buddy, Kent Denlinger, and he and I are going to be walking through these for the next several weeks. So as we dive into this now, Kent, last time we chatted a little bit about the first question. Um, Tell me what you think about the second question as we start to move into that a little bit today. (sighs) Second question feels pretty central when we think about the sanctification process. What is God really up to? And one thing that struck me in thinking about this is where the title of the ministry, Larger Story, comes in. Because if we don't understand the larger story, then we are tempted to grasp at things that actually may not be what God is up to. We might read a verse like even ask whatever you want and expect that God's going to come through for us now. When in reality, the larger story kind of informs us that God is up to something so much greater that has to do with eternal perspective versus the here and now. So this question feels really central to me and really needs understood and can be understood from a lot of different angles. I totally agree, Kent. As I was looking through this too, what's God up to? I think does. I think the word central or foundational is is so important to thinking about these seven questions. Because as you talk about God being uh, a trinity in the first question, who is God? He's a community, uh, a perfect community that relates perfectly with each other. And then now, what's God up to? And you talk about the larger story of his purposes that are going to be fulfilled no matter what. And so I guess the question that I always think about is, which I start to go into is, who are we and what have we done? I start to want to get ahead of ourselves a little bit. But as I dive into the second question and think about, What's God up to right now? It just seems like a, like you said, foundational, but such a an important thing to chat about and to think about, because quite frankly, sometimes that just doesn't even seem to come across our minds. What's God doing now? It's We're so self-focused that we lose sight of what's happening in God's larger story, like you said. Yeah. And I think this is where we want to connect the questions. So as you think back to question one, and my little pet summary phrase is think relationally. And so as we think about what God's up to in our lives, we want to think relationally. We want to think about what he's up to when it has to do with relationship with him vertically and horizontally, what does it have to do with each other? And so we want to capture or encapsulate ourselves around that concept of thinking relationally as we think about answers to the second question. Let me ask you, Cap, if you had to summarize this second question, if somebody wanted you to, hey, just give me a brief synopsis of what do you think God's up to? What, Where's your mind go? Yeah, I think just in my own experience in the last little bit, what he's up to in my own life is, is making me like himself. And the whole notion of philipsis on the narrow road, the crushing out of you, the stuff that he doesn't want to have in you, which doesn't leave a whole lot left because I think most of that stuff is what I am. But that's what I think he's been doing to me. That's what he's up to in my life right now. And so I love to think of kind of what you said in in respect to the larger story, because it's so much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just the thing that I sometimes notice is how hard it is to take our eyes off of ourself, even when we're trying to do and think about good things. Our self, just the flesh and our self just seems to come into play so much. And I've just, I've been wrestling with how do we get on the other side of that? And I don't know if we ever do in this side of eternity. Um, We do. Our flesh is going to be with us all the time. 
And I think we have to really give up on any notion that somehow we're going to get better. I was just conversing with somebody this morning and they were in a small group and some 70 year old man was talking about how he thought sure he'd be further than he was, that he'd have power over certain things now. And I think we have to give up on that idea. It isn't as if God doesn't sometimes change some of those things. But while we might find victory in some area, God's going to make us aware of another area where we're, we're so lacking in being like Christ. And so I think we have to just come to accept the reality that our flesh is always with us. And we're always going to struggle with this tension between our flesh and the life of God inside of us. And there's no, there's just no escaping that. I don't like that, Kent. (laughs) (laughs) And frankly, as we think about this question, we have to realize and think counterintuitively. We have a verse for that in Isaiah where God says, my ways are not your ways. And so what he's up to is not going to be consistent with what we would like. (laughs) And yet it's life-giving. I've I've always thought about Jacob when he wrestled with God, he lost, but he won. (laughs) And that's true in this instance. We're going to, we're going to, part of this, what God is up to answer is going to feel like we're losing something. It's not what we expected. And yet it is a path to life that just feels counterintuitive. That's such an interesting word, that whole word counterintuitive. It just goes against what we naturally would think, which I guess is why the word has to become supernatural. Yeah. It's, it's no longer just our natural thing. It's now a supernatural response that we can only have provided we have the life of Jesus in us. Yeah, I had, I had breakfast with, with a, a really close friend this last week, and she was she and dad have met many times as well at this restaurant. And I came in there and I hadn't seen her in a while. And I got emotional, it just reminded me so much of my time with dad. But what was so interesting is when you start to talk about the word relational, because what's God up to? He's trying to form us like Jesus, to relate like Jesus, because that's what he's all about. And so having that breakfast with this woman this last week was just such a life-giving time for me because she just said some things that, that were just relating like Jesus, mm. which just gives you the a little bit of that feeling of, I feel like I'm in a place that God wants me to be. You, know, you referenced just, earlier how that crushing and leaves you and that God is at work making, making us new. And I think in a, a short, although it needs a lot of definition, but a short response to the question, an answer to the question, what has God up to, is... is a couple of places in scripture where he talks about Revelation 21 being one of those. I'm making all things new. That's present tense. I'm in the process right now. And then Paul expounds on it to say, he's making us into new creatures. <laughs> and then you got to ask the question, well, what's that process look like? And that's where I think we start getting into the counterintuitive thing. And I love your image, that that idea of being crushed, broken down, because I, I, my answer to this recently would come out of the book of Ruth. And as I think about Naomi, as she returned home, having lost her sons and her husband, and now Ruth's in tow with her, she gets back, arrives back in the town of Bethlehem. And the town women come to her and say, after this has been a 10 or 12 years absence, and they say, is this Naomi? And Naomi says to them, no, call me Mara, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And that's what Mara means. But then she says this. And this has really stopped me to think. She said, I went away full, but I have returned empty. And I thought about that phrase and I thought, (laughs) isn't that what the work of the Spirit of God is? Isn't that the answer to this question? What is God up to? He's up to emptying us of everything that gets in the way of us being like Christ. And there is no way around that process of being filled with suffering. In, in all the various forms that it comes. I love the word process, because one of the things that, that I talked about this last week with this gal, and she said, God is so interested in the process of what's happening. Yeah. And that's the philipsis. That's the, the yeah. emptying out of what he doesn't want in there. And that's such a painful process oftentimes, Yeah, because we fight that so hard. We, we want to keep some of that stuff. We think we need to right. keep that. God says, no, I'm, right. I'm getting rid of it. And it's no, I'm fighting. And then, boy, that's just uncomfortable. And we keep filling our lives up with all these things that we think are going to give us life. And God has to empty us of those things so that he can fill. St. John of the Cross spoke about how God is this 
ever flowing stream of life looking for narrow or looking for empty spaces to fill. And, and that's not a permanent thing, but it's like he can't and until we're emptied, he can't fill. And I think Naomi was saying something. She didn't even realize what she was saying, but she was even she was attributing all that to the Lord. That this is what the Lord has done to me. And it felt terrible to her. It didn't feel like life. And that's where that counterintuitive idea comes in. But it, it's unnecessary. Your father, Larry, used to speak about this from the perspective of a detach, attach model of sanctification. Yeah. We have to be detached from what we think is life in order to be attached to what truly is life. And I don't think there's a better illustration of this than the rich young ruler. Yeah. Is, here's a man who had everything that if we had it, we think we we would be on top of the world. He's got his he's got his youth, he's got power, he's got money, he's even religious, and yet something didn't quite feel right that drove him to the Lord. And the Lord says, "I don't think this is a story about money. I think it's a story about what has a hold of our hearts that needs emptied out." And to the Lord said to him, "Go give your money to the poor and come follow me." And I think what he's in he's inviting him to detach from something that he has thought would bring him life. And I think Naomi thought life was found in having sons and having a family and everything working the way she thought. And, and God empties her, which puts her in a position to end to see the larger story, to see what yeah. God is doing, which happens to be a son, grandson, great-grandson, whatever it is down the road, who is Jesus. Which means he's everything. <laughs> We're talking about the larger story, but yeah. man, you can't see that in the moment. You just feel the ache of being crushed or emptied. And yet it's, again, it's counterintuitive, but it's life-giving. Yeah. It's to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. Yes. That's the counterintuitive piece. And the whole detachment thought, as, I'm, as my mind goes to it now, is so painful. Yeah. The detachment piece can be so challenging as you, you're, you're being ripped away from what you think really is life-giving. It's not. It's right. death. And that's the whole thing of what we see now. And how we see things, and this is where I've been for the last few years, especially since dad's death, is up is down and left is right and black is white and white is black. And everything's just upside down in so many different ways with our society and culture, but also in respect to what God wants from us. We have to lose ourselves to find ourselves. How do you start that detachment process, Kent, that God is so eager to want to see happen in all of us? I don't know whether we start that process or that process belongs to the Lord. I think if we are one of his children, if we're a son or daughter of God, then he's committed to us and he's committed to making us like his son. And living in this fallen world as fallen people, um, suffering and struggle, something your dad normalized, is going to come. And how we respond to that, or is there an openness? Is there a consideration? I remember in the book of Jeremiah chapter two, Jeremiah speaking for the Lord says, two people responsible for the health of the nation, the priest and the spiritual fathers, failed to ask a question. Same question twice, verse five and eight, I think it is. And the question was, where is the Lord? I think another way of asking that question is, what is God doing? What is God up to? Our question here. Question number two. And they stopped asking that question. Then life becomes all about us yes. and, and what works for us. And so I think we have to have a mindset, and especially as we companion with other people or doing spiritual direction, counseling, whatever it is, we have to have a mindset of, I wonder what God is up to when this struggle comes. Because every one of us, when struggle and suffering comes, our first instinct is get out of it, get away from it. And it takes another friend a lot of times, or at least the wisdom within ourselves to go, okay, wait a minute, slow down. God might actually be up to something. And the struggle that comes into our lives, this feels like an important sentence. The struggle that comes into our lives is not necessarily because we've done something wrong, but it will expose what is wrong inside of us. Yeah. And that feels really important. That's the story of Job. Yeah. God said Job was a good man, a great man. He had done nothing wrong, despite the testimony of his friends. And yet it did end up exposing what was wrong deep in his heart that he needed to repent of. And we just have to have that mindset if we're going to be detached from things. we got to know, one, that I do attach myself to things 
And then I've got to understand what God's up to. And I got to be willing to ask the question, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And can I slow down and be patient enough to not get ahead of the process, short circuit the process, not help another person get out of that process, but to believe that this process is vital to my life and my spiritual formation. I love that. And I love the whole notion of the thought of what is our role in the detachment piece, but it's really God doing that work. Mm -hmm. God detaching us from what he wants us to not be attached to and then attaching us to himself yeah, which is what he wants us attached to. And, and so that at some level takes a little bit of the pressures off, but there is a role that we've got to play and we've got to be willing. I, we were talking with some people this last weekend and someone said that as you're inviting the spirit to come in, how do you set your mind and your heart and your spirit, your own spirit in a way that invites the spirit to come in? How do you prepare yourself for that? And that kind of feels like opening the door for the spirit then to do his most important work, which is detaching us. Yeah. Because I know we have a role and it feels like that I'm starting to understand that role a little bit more as I start to realize that this just isn't it. This world, no matter how good it can be, it's never going to be good enough. Yeah. It's never going to be enough. And what I've come to realize too, is even the fun times when you go on some family vacations with your kids and your grandkids and just, you're having a great time. It just doesn't ever hit a spot that maybe it used to. Mm -hmm. Things that, you know, at, at, at times before were, you, you were fulfilled. You felt more satisfied now. And I'm looking forward to having my first grandson born here in, in a few months. That's going to be a hoot. But I know that's not my life. Mm -hmm. That's not what gives life. I'm, am I excited for it? Am I going to love this kid? Absolutely. But it just doesn't do it. And I'm starting to realize more. I think I said this to you last time we chatted. I start to understand, I'm starting to understand dad a little bit more in the last few years since he's been gone as I'm, as I've been wrestling with things and saying, oh, I want to grab the phone and call that Oh, He's not around. I can't call that guy, but God's doing something and he's on the move. And what's, what is, what he's up to is such an important thing for us to keep on the forefront of our minds. Cause it allows us to realize what the, the rest of the questions, how you said they're all really linked together. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's just a really encouraging thing, Ken. I think another way, there's a lot of ways to think about this, but uh, I think the end of Jesus's prayer in John 17, his high priestly prayer, it's called, he basically says, here's my deepest desire is that you come to know the love that the father and the son share. That's again, we're thinking relationally that what happened was sin and this world dismembered us. It, it dismembered us. It broke us away from the community that we are created for. And so in some ways, another way to answer the question, what's God up to, is that he is re-membering us. He's reconnecting us to the Godhead. And so even as we take communion and we say, and Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Part Another way to think about it is not just my memory, but it's it's we're being remembered into the body of Christ, into the life of the Godhead. And that's ultimately what Jesus came to do. He didn't just come to save us from hell. He came to connect us back to the Godhead and to the love and the purpose that flows out of that. And when we grasp that, that we're loved sons and daughters, then that life inside of us is going to want to naturally flow outward toward him and toward others. And so that's another way of thinking about this idea of what's God up to? He's up to remembering us into the community of the Godhead so that we can join them in their love and their purpose. Man, I love that. Remembering. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's important for us to keep on the forefront of our minds. That's what you, when you're talking with somebody, that's what ought to be shaping our minds is this is a person who, because of their sin, because of the sin of the world, because of the brokenness of this world has gotten dislodged, has gotten, is broken away from community, whether it's in, in their, immediate relationships or with God, which are simultaneous in a sense. And so what I'm trying to do is listen and think about what's caused that and how do I help them discover that they're really meant to be part of this community? Because sin isolates, sin yeah. creates individualism everywhere. And that's not, we, we're, we're foolish enough to believe that in American culture, especially that's life and it's not no. and to actually be my job is to help a person get remembered into the community that God had um, and that they're loved and that they belong someplace. So, yeah. 
I love that. And I, I think as we just get ready to wrap here with, as we're looking at these seven questions and what you're talking about in respect to, especially these first two, but really all of them is how they impact how you relate to people now. Yeah. And, and when you have these on the forefront of your mind, who is God? What's he up to? Who are we? What's gone wrong? What's the spirit doing? All of these questions, they shape how you think yes. and how you relate to people now. And one of the things that I think has been so exciting to think about, and this is a quick question I'd love for you to think about, is you went through a number of the schools of spiritual direction. You were involved in, of the 78 or so that were done, you were involved in a lot of them. As the seven questions became, and it's obvious that it's happened, but they became part of you. I remember when I was talking with Tripp, he said the first time I heard him, oh, they were neat. And oh, those, that's a neat thought. And then by, by the 50th time you heard him, he said, that is central. That is the key. That's yeah. the linchpin to what we're thinking about. How has that impacted you here and here in this all the time? And yeah. why are these questions so important? Why are we taking a series right now to talk about these things for people? Because they're everything. Yeah. I remember back in Warsaw driving with Larry, actually can remember right where we were at on the road. And I said to him, probably the thing that the counseling program, this is even before the schools, but what the counseling program did for me was it began to give me categories to think in. And I just remember that word was so strong to me that there's a way of thinking that makes sense out of the larger story. It helps me understand there is a larger story unfolding. And then it helps me understand who God is and who I am. And, and I started teaching some of this stuff to my middle schoolers at the church where I pastored. And I just, it just made sense. I likened this last week to like fundamentals in any sport or photography or anything else. If you learn the fundamentals, then the game becomes, has a potential to have more fluidity to it and a rhythm to it. And that's the way this is. These things have given me a rhythm of understanding who God is and what he's doing and who I am and how all that fits together like a jigsaw puzzle that turns into this beautiful picture. But if you don't have that, then you just got a bunch of pieces that you're yes. trying to put together. And so I think the more you think about it, the more you learn them. And again, this isn't just conceptual information. This is, you were saying it quite well. This is what helps me be a companion to yes. my brothers and sisters. This is what helps me when I sit down at breakfast and somebody says to me, man, I'm not doing well. You know, this is what helps me read the scriptures and think, what is God saying here? What, it, what how does, how am I get this into my flesh? Wait a minute. I've got some categories for understanding that. So I don't know. That's a long answer to your good question, but I just, they've been life altering to me. Um, you said something in there too, that really caught my ear is when you were pastoring at the church, the last time you started to offer this to your your junior high school kids and your and, and the younger kids. And this is something that I've seen that kind of irrespective of your age, especially in that category, junior high to even our kids' age now who are, who are adults, that that really gets through. It, it makes sense to these kids. Mm -hmm. And as we start to prepare Kent for a conference that we're going to be doing in a little bit on cross-generational discipleship, how do we take this stuff and really pour that into these kids, these younger folks, these yeah. the, the next generation yeah. as they're coming up. And this seems to be such a, something that kind of grabbed me is such a launch pad yeah. that I think these guys can really get their heads and, and arms wrapped around the whole notion of these seven questions. And then it helps shape them as they're relating now to people. And it becomes this organic movement that I think can be really powerful. Yeah. I remember when I did my doctoral work, I interviewed, this wasn't necessarily just kids related, although it was some, but I interviewed people within the church, about 25 or 30 people. And then I interviewed about 15 or 20 outside of the church. And just a simple thing, like I asked people, one of the questions I ask is define sin. Yeah. And almost everybody outside of our church, and this isn't braggadocious, I don't think it's just a discernment that I noticed. Everybody outside the church defines sin the way you would in a classroom breaking God's moral law, something to that effect. And everybody, literally almost everybody in our church, whether they had been there two to five years or 25 years, understood sin as a violation of relationship, of, of, of a commitment to self. And I just was so thrilled because yeah. I thought that's a category. That's a category that makes a difference in how you're going to read scripture, how you're going to live. Because one is just, me making a, a bad behavior, bad choice thing. The other is I've harmed 
somebody. I've harmed God. And that that makes all the difference in the world as to my brokenness, even when I see that I'm harming the people that I love, you know, um, and didn't even realize I was doing it. That's a whole different ballgame than, oh, I broke a rule. Big deal. Everything boils down to relational implications. Yeah. Think relationally. <laughs> Think relationally. And that's it. And that's who God is. And, and that's really what he's up to is forming us like himself. Yeah. So as we start to think about this, Kent, and we'll come back and we'll start to talk about the next question the next time we chat, but that's going to be, who are we? And we've talked a little bit about that today as well, but I hope that everyone will join us next time as we chat about that question, as we move through the seven questions of spiritual theology, as we jump on question number three next time, who are we? We hope you join us. Thanks for joining us today. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below, then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel. For more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at largerstory.com.